In this talk, we are going to learn about the different features of protists, which are eukaryotic organisms. Eukaryotes are thought to have evolved after prokaryotes. According to the fossil record, we are able to detect single-celled eukaryotes around 2 billion years ago. Now, U stands for true and carrion means nucleus or kernel. Now, nucleus itself means a tiny kernel or a nut. The reason the nucleus was named this way because when we look at a cell and observe the nucleus, it does indeed look like a tiny nut or kernel that is present in the cell. The nucleus is the compartment of the cell where the DNA is present. In the case of all eukaryotes, we do observe the presence of the nucleus, which is the home of its genetic information, or DNA. All eukaryotes are grouped in the domain of eukarya. There is immense diversity among eukaryotes. Some are unicellular, while others are multicellular. There are four traditional kingdoms in the domain of eukarya. The first one is protista. The organisms that belong to this kingdom that has now been abandoned are protists. The reason it has been abandoned is because the members are genetically very variable from one another, and hence this kingdom is not a monophyletic group. Fungi is another kingdom of eukarya, followed by plantae, which includes organisms that are photoautotrophs. Animalia is the last or fourth traditional kingdom that is observed in the domain of eukarya. Any eukaryotic organism that does not show features of a fungus, a plant, or an animal is considered as a protist. This vague definition of a protist results in a very diverse kingdom, which was the kingdom of protista. Due to this diversity, the kingdom of protista is not a monophyletic kingdom. When we look at the phylogenetic tree, we are able to see that plants, fungi, and animals arose from ancestors that belong to the kingdom of protista. However, plants, fungi, and animals were not considered to be part of the kingdom of protista. This also shows that hence the kingdom of Protista is not a monophyletic kingdom. Thus, the kingdom of Protista no longer exists and is not used by taxonomists and systematists. Organisms that are considered to be protists are now being grouped based on their genetic characteristics. By analyzing their nucleic acid and genetic information, these organisms are now being grouped into supergroups with the hope that monophyletic clades can be formed. Now, despite the genetic similarities, we can observe that there are certain members of groups that may show very different phenotypes. And hence, protists are a very diverse group of organisms. In fact, they are considered as the most diverse group of organisms. A typical protist cell has a plasma membrane that is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. This is similar to what is observed in bacteria, but different than what is seen in archaea. All protists have a nucleus, and in some cases they may have even more than one. For example, in paramecium, it has a macronucleus and one or more micronuclei. Most protists have mitochondria, which is a membrane-bound organelle, and they also tend to have endoplasmic reticulum. This includes the rough as well as the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. All protists have the Golgi complex and vacuoles, which are large fluid-filled vesicles that can have specialized functions. For example, some can store and digest food, while others can store waste products. Some protists have a cell wall and this cell wall can be made up of polysaccharides like cellulose, which is seen in different types of algae. Other protists, like diatoms, can have a cell wall that is made up of silicon dioxide or silica. 
Some protists are autotrophs and have chloroplast. In some protists, we can see appendages like flagella and cilia. Flagella are long, hair-like appendages that help protists move. In addition to flagella, some protists can also have cilia, which are much shorter hair-like appendages that also aid in movement or motility. Flagella and cilia that are present in protists are structurally similar to one another. However, when we compare their structure with the bacterial flagella, it is quite different. The bacterial flagella has three main parts, which is the filament, the hook, and the basal body. In the case of protists, the flagella or cilia are usually covered by the plasma membrane, which is not the case with bacterial flagella. Bacterial flagella is made with the protein flagellin, but in the case of protists, the flagella and cilia are made up of microtubules, which is a cytoskeletal protein. The microtubules are arranged in a very characteristic fashion in flagella and cilia, which is called as the 9 plus 2 arrangement. In addition to flagella and cilia, some protists can use pseudopodia for moving around. Pseudopodia translates to false feet. Pseudopodia are essentially cytoplasmic projections that aid the protists to move around. Pseudopodia are usually formed through the reorganization of actin, which is another type of cytoskeletal protein. The actin reorganizes to form microfilaments, and these microfilaments then allow the formation of pseudopodia in different parts of the cell. Protists can use different sources of energy and carbon as part of their life cycle. Photoautotrophs are those that are able to use light as a source of energy and use inorganic carbon dioxide to synthesize various organic carbon compounds of the cell. Heterotrophic protists, on the other hand, are the ones that use organic carbon compounds as energy sources as well as carbon sources. Phagotrophs are those protists that are able to ingest food particles, and these food particles then reside in food vacuoles where they then get broken down. Osmotrophs are those that are able to ingest food in a soluble form. This is usually done through the process of pino or macropinocytosis. Mixotrophs are those protists that can change their nutritional requirements and become phototrophic in certain conditions and heterotrophic in other conditions. Most protists are aerobic organisms and hence they use oxygen in the electron transport chain in order to perform oxidative phosphorylation that aids in the production of ATP. Now there are some protists that are anaerobes and scientists have found that some of these anaerobes are actually predators of prokaryotes. They are able to ingest prokaryotic cells as we can see in this figure where wherever we see green are actually prokaryotic organisms like bacteria. Some other protists that are anaerobes are actually found to be parasites as well. Thus, different protists have different oxygen requirements. Some protists are able to exist in two stages. The trophozoite stage is where the organism is metabolically active, growing, and reproducing. When environmental conditions get harsh, these protists can then form a cyst, which is a dormant stage which protects the protists from the harshness of the environment. Most protists are unicellular organisms. However, there are some that are multicellular as well. In some instances, we can see individual organisms come together to form a colony or a collection of cells where even though they are in close proximity to one another, they independently live from one another. An example of such a colony is Volvox, where we're able to see the Volvox cells present in a Volvox colony. In some cases, 
The protists can exist in unicellular as well as multicellular forms. An ideal example are the cellular slime molds. Dictyostelium species belong to this group of organisms. They can exist as unicellular amoebae. However, when starvation conditions are introduced, then these free-living unicellular amoebae can come together and aggregate to form a multicellular structure called as a slug. With time, the slug can undergo changes to give rise to a multicellular fruiting body. This multicellular fruiting body has spores within it that are then released and can germinate when the conditions are favorable to give back the unicellular amoebae. Here's a picture that shows different stages of the formation of the fruiting bodies in Dictyostelium. Some protists are always multicellular, like algae. In fact, algae show true multicellularity. True multicellularity is observed when the cells are able to contact each other and are able to show coordinated activities. True multicellularity, in fact, is observed only in eukaryotes. Even though we can see different prokaryotic organisms living together in groups, they do not display true multicellularity. The advantage of multicellularity is that it allows specialization functions to evolve. Division of labor is possible and this allows organisms to become more complex. Hence, the ability to become multicellular is a key innovation that evolved in eukaryotes and was evolutionarily favored. Hence, we are able to see a wide variety of multicellular organisms in the environment. Protists can show different modes of reproduction. They show both asexual and sexual modes of reproduction. One common sexual mode of reproduction that is observed in protists is binary fission. This is also observed in prokaryotes. In the case of binary fission, a parent cell is able to duplicate its DNA content. Once the DNA content is duplicated, the cell can undergo division by forming a septum. This results in two independent cells that are daughter cells and genetically identical to the parent cell. Budding is another form of asexual reproduction observed in protists. In budding, a small outgrowth is formed on the cell, and this outgrowth or bud grows in size. The parent cell on which this bud is formed will ultimately replicate its genome and provide a copy of this genome to the bud. The bud grows in size and finally breaks off from the parent cell. Thus, in this case, we are able to form two cells, but one cell is smaller in size than the other cell. Eventually, the bud will grow in size to match that of the parent cell. Hence, in budding, we are able to form two cells, but the process is different than binary fission. Another mode of asexual reproduction is called multiple fission, or schizogony. In this scenario, we start off with the parent cell, and the nucleus of the parent cell undergoes many rounds of division to give rise to many nuclei present in that single cell. This division of nuclei is called as karyogamy. Once multiple nuclei are formed, the cytoplasm and other cell components are distributed, and hence we can end up with many, many daughter cells. Mitosis is another mode of asexual reproduction observed in protists. Mitosis can be divided into different phases, and we start off with a cell that is going to undergo mitosis. It condenses its genetic material in the prophase stage, and once its genetic material is condensed, a mitotic spindle forms. In the prometaphase stage, the nuclear envelope starts dissolving and the complete mitosis spindle is formed. The metaphase stage is where the microtubules in the mitotic spindle are able to associate with the different condensed chromosomes and align them on a plane called as the metaphase plate. 
In the case of anaphase, the microtubules of the mitotic spindle are able to pull apart the chromosomes so that we are able to have one copy of each chromosome on two parts of the cell. In telophase, we are able to see the genetic information has been distributed into the two daughter cells and new nuclei are being formed. Finally, cytokinesis occurs and we end up with two daughter cells which have the same amount of genetic material as the parent. Mitosis is much more complex than binary fission, budding, or schizogony. In fact, the mitosis that we see today, we are able to observe intermediate stages in other types of protists. For example, in most eukaryotes, there is a complete dissolution of the nuclear membrane before mitosis is completed. However, in the case of some protists like diatoms and some fungi like yeast, we are actually able to observe a mitotic spindle type of apparatus being formed within the nucleus, and thus there is no dissolution of the nuclear membrane. Hence, mitosis has evolved over time to the process that we see today. Protists can also show sexual modes of reproduction. Sexual reproduction usually involves meiosis, which is a type of cell division that results in the reduction of the number of chromosomes. For meiosis to happen, pairs of chromosomes have to be present, and hence the organism has to be diploid. It is possible to envision that an organism was able to create pairs of its chromosome through genome duplication events. Either way, once these pairs of chromosomes are present or homologous chromosomes are present, meiosis is possible. In meiosis, the daughter cells have half the amount of genetic information as the parent cell and are called as haploid. For example, in this case, if we consider the parent cell having two chromosomes and they are homologous chromosomes, then after meiosis occurs, the daughter cells that are formed, which are four of them, each one will have only one chromosome. Thus, we went from two chromosomes present in the parent cell to one chromosome present in the daughter cell. Hence, meiosis results in the reduction in the number of chromosomes, and usually the daughter cells will have half the number of chromosomes that the parent cell has. The haploid cells can reconstitute an organism with the original number of DNA molecules by fusion. Thus, we can have a scenario where two haploid cells are able to fuse to give rise to a diploid cell that has the original number of chromosomes. Meiosis was a major innovation because it had the ability to introduce genetic diversity, which was associated with vertical gene transfer instead of horizontal gene transfer. Hence, meiosis enables populations to have more genetic variation among the different members. With this, we come to the end of our talk where we learned about general features of eukaryotes and the abandoned kingdom of protista. We also learned how now protists are being classified based on their genetic characteristics to form these supergroups, as well as the general features of a protist cell. We saw how some protists are multicellular and the different modes of reproduction that are employed by protists.